Pulse.com and cover some of the most amazing stories you can ever imagine. Linda. And she's here to talk with us about uh, some What's great up? stories tonight, including this first hour, this bizarre case in Cuba where Americans and Canadian diplomats have gotten very, very ill from something that has been affecting their mind, their brain. It's just a strange story. And, Linda, before we quickly get into this, I wanted to thank you for becoming part of our tribute program to Art Bell. I really appreciate your... Oh, uh, your yeah. Comments. To me, he's not gone. He's in another dimension, and uh, his impact on all of us uh, was great. It's, so. it's almost surreal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like he's still here, he's still part of it, but he's gone on to another place. You really well, now, it's going on to another place. These Americans and Canadians are getting out of Cuba. What's going on? That's right. He would have loved this story. Um, I remember my uh, total fascination and confusion when nine months ago in August 2017, there were a series of these international headlines about a mysterious syndrome that was making American and Canadian diplomats in the U.S. Embassy in Havana sick with hearing loss, headaches, dizziness, fuzzy vision, losing balance and not being able to think straight. And to date, tonight, the total Royce affected the so far have been 24 Americans and 10 Canadians. Well, on October 12, 2017, the Associated Press was the first to release a short six-second recording of one of the many strange sounds recorded by investigators at the Cuban Embassy. Associated Press stated, quote, the recordings themselves are not believed to be dangerous to those who listen. Sound experts and doctors say they know of no sound that can cause physical damage when played for short durations at normal levels through standard That's equipment like a cell phone say. or computer, close quote. And with that, I placed the six-second recording of, the sec of that sound released by Associated Press at my news website, earthfiles.com. You just go to Earth Files and click on my report at the top of the page entitled Part 1, Mysterious Brain Concussion Injuries in Cuban Embassy. Now, I have listened to this strange, irritating sound that reminds me of like a speeded up cicada. And the Cuban embassy diplomats who have been affected by these brain attacks confirmed that the AP audio that I now have at my website, that this recording is consistent with what they heard. That's the sound one of them said. Well, what device produced the original sounds remains unknown to this day. Americans affected in Havana reported they perceived that the sounds hit them at extreme volumes. Is a sonic weapon the culprit? If so, who was aiming at the offices of American and Canadian diplomats and why? An acoustics expert and engineering professor at George Washington University analyzed the AP recording with a spectrum analyzer that measures a signal's frequency and amplitude. He concluded that there were 20-some different frequencies or pitches embedded in the odd sound, and they were evenly spaced. He also found that the sound pulsed in varying lengths this way, 7 seconds, 12 seconds, two seconds, then repeating for several minutes, then silence for one second, or 13 seconds, or four seconds, before the sound abruptly started the whole cycle all over again. The U.S. Navy also analyzed several audio recordings, but did not respond to requests for comment about the Associated Press tape. Trying to figure out what happened to the 24 American and 10 Canadian diplomats that worked at the Cuban Embassy is Douglas H. Smith, MD. He is professor of neurosurgery and director of the Center for Brain Injury and Repair at the University of Pennsylvania. And here he is now from Philadelphia. It was actually quite different from person to person. The one thing that was the same was hearing a strange sound, typically loud, but the difference was the sound could be anything from a high-pitched type of noise or something that sounded like cicadas to a low tone. 
a kind of scraping metal tone, and even the sensations that you described were different. Like some people felt vibrations or that weird feeling you have when the car windows open. You have like a baffling type of sensation to others just feeling kind of out of it. So the description of the initial encounter with whatever this exposure was, was all over the place, with the exception of that most of them felt they had a strange experience with some sound. Was there full hearing loss with anyone? No. In a couple of cases, there was some hearing loss. In most cases, that is not the case. The complaints at that time, it seemed to be something about hearing a noise and maybe some ear pain and headaches. So the initial exams were like an ear, nose, and throat type of specialty to examine them. It was during those exams that while there was clearly some auditory, something about the hearing, that they also had what really kind of looked like persisting concussion symptoms. And so that's what brought them to the University of Pennsylvania and to our center to be examined specifically to see how these symptoms were similar or different from concussion. And in fact, in the recent New York Times, it says, quoting you, uniformly, everyone who saw these patients was absolutely convinced it looked like concussion pathology, inability to remember, processing speed. Those are such classic symptoms we see in concussion. We all believe this is a real syndrome. This is concussion without blunt head trauma, close quote, quoting you. Can you expand into what you have found and what your interpretation is currently of the concussion without blunt head trauma? Nobody likes to have balance issues or have vision issues where they really can't quite convert your eye to read. Your job is to read a computer screen, for example, or papers. But for anyone, I think that their biggest concern is that they would complain about the most with cognition if they're not at their full performance and how quickly they think and memory function just you noted. So that was the most impressive, but certainly the balance issues and vision issues were a very common finding amongst these individuals. What would produce sounds that would range from cicada to high pitch to a variety of pitches? We don't think audible sound, the range where humans can hear sound, can hurt your brain. So we think the sound or the sounds that were heard or even maybe imagined because, you know, you can have the exception of sound with some kinds of energy exposures without an actual sound. But we think that there is no sound that hurt their brains. It's not the sound. We think that was a side effect. For example, if you heard a mechanical noise in the woods and you went in to investigate and a bunch of trees cut down, you don't think it was the sound that cut the trees down. So we think the sound was coincident with whatever was causing the injuries. And the different type of sound could be for a variety of reasons. It could be how close the noise is. Any speculation about distance from the embassy in Cuba that these directed energy weapons would have to have been to have so much impact on so many people? Yeah, I mean, just think about it. Like an example. Something that's used medically is ultrasound. That's used to ablate axons, nerve fibers that might give you pain someplace in your body. But that's done with direct contact with a device through gel. And similarly, this is also used to to ablate, destroy tumors in the brain, but that's also very direct contact with the tumor. That's with a big device with direct contact. It's hard to imagine what kind of device could send something like ultrasound through the air, which it doesn't travel well, through maybe walls or glass windows, to hit a human body, penetrate the skull, and then go into the brain. So why would these types of energies only hurt the brain and not other regions of the body? So I'm afraid I might have more questions than answers, but it is extremely hard to imagine how a directed energy beam is employed that's targeted even maybe certain individuals, although we're not sure about that, and that can travel long distances. Uh So what you bring up is very much the conundrum. Well, as I hear what you just said, you are describing some kind of a technology that would be able to focus at any specific distance programmed with the idea that if the generator were 100 yards away, 
that it would be built so that the frequency would have a focus 100 yards through brick, through window, through skull, with a focus in the brain matter. Yeah, but you'd also need line of sight. Even if you imagine you could focus it, then how would you always have line of sight to an individual? Wow. These are all really kind of perplexing. You could go back to what happens in the brain in concussion. We have a fair idea that the blow to the head causes the brain tissue to push and pull against itself, and that selectively injures the brain's network, which is made up of all these tiny fibers that would take more than 100 next to each other to be as wide as a human hair. And they really form the electric grid of the brain. But they're so small, they're fragile to these mechanical forces of impact and they become damaged. And that can explain why that the processing speed, how quickly you think, could be affected because you can't send signals quickly across this damaged network. So we understand that from a mechanical point of view for concussion or a single blow. How can you end up with a similar type of symptomatology based on network problems in the brain without the blow to the head? Is there another type of vibration force that even though it's not a major blow to the head, it can still disrupt these nerve fibers in a similar way that concussion does? And have you talked about exactly that question with anybody from the Department of Defense? We have not been in close contact with the Department of Defense. We have funding from them for traumatic brain injury research. This would be more open discussions with people from various government agencies to discuss how could you arrive at this type of damage. I'm wondering if there is some black project, some weapon that has been yeah, developed right. that can target specifically brain matter, like a molecule-specific resonance frequency so that it would go through a lot of things to target brain matter. Is it possible that DARPA or some of the Department of Defense offices might be working in black projects trying to come up with molecule-specific energy systems? It. This is way outside my purview. I could only speculate as much as anybody off the street. It's possible that there's something unique about the brain that would make it selectively vulnerable to some type of directed energy. For example, maybe the skull creates an echo chamber or maybe the tissue properties of the brain. The skull is technology has already been established. But I can tell you, I don't know if that's true. I don't know any he mechanism know. that would do that. But I have to be suspicious that there is something unique about the brain because the rest of the body's nervous system has the same type of small fiber structures that are in your nerves, and they were not affected. Wow. Who would have the technical ability to do this, and why? Yeah, I don't know. That's not my purview. But we look at this as a cluster, a public health issue. It affects a cluster of individuals. It's very curious that these individuals are American diplomats, by and large. The Canadians were affected as well. And that is the most recent round of people leaving? That's the most recent group of people leaving, yes. The Americans, we found 24, only 21 of which we had full workups. And the Canadians, I read, there could be up to 10. So you have to wonder in this strange world of neural toxins like Novichok that we've heard about recently, or radioactive poisoning with polonium, or other even just PCBs that have been used. Most people think if you want to send a message, you could just shoot somebody, but we have never heard of anything like this before. We only had diplomatic relations opened up at the end of the Barack Obama administration with Cuba, and that all of this has happened since then, and that seems contradictory to the idea of trying to increase friendship and diplomatic ability between the United States and Cuba. So who would have a motive to try to hurt American diplomats in the embassy and have some kind of technology that is not out in the public to do this? You know, that's right. So that would be an that's important part of the investigation. And as you might know, the FBI went down to uh, Cuba to investigate, and I'm sure other agencies are investigating. There's a Senate subcommittee meeting with, with Marco Rubio, who questioned people from the State Department and others to get at this exact question. And you'd have to understand the motivation, which might help where this came from, why it came. Unfortunately, I would say, though, 
if the goal was to get the American diplomats to leave, the Canadian diplomats are also leaving, by and large. You know, only skeleton crews are being left behind. Has anybody speculated with you from a military context if there is knowledge that the Russians are experimenting with directed energy weapons and that Russia might be the culprit? So I think certainly almost all major powers have some kind of programs to look at energy beams of sorts for multiple purposes. One might be to they have for many, many years. Or drones or missiles. Now, in this whole question about uh, some kind of energy beam uh, weapons, mm -hmm. there are three categories of frequencies that I'm going to get into in some detail in the next half hour. And they fall into the category of infrasound, ultrasound, and microwaves. And as we, uh, before the break, just for people to get into their minds, human hearing range is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Below 20 hertz down to 4 hertz, that's infrasound. The human ear cannot hear that. Above 20,000 hertz is ultrasound. Infrasound is usually not perceived as any kind of a tonal sound, but it's rather a, like a feeling, a sensation of pulsation, pressure on the ears or chest. That's normally what infrasound would uh, relate to a human. Ultrasound can cause ear pressure, headaches, nausea, and fatigue. Microwaves are electromagnetic waves with frequencies that range from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz, and they, of course, can cause heating. There was some change in the temperatures of the room and the people also affected by this uh, syndrome in the Cuban embassy. And, and when you hear, as I break down these details in the next half hour, it really does seem like that it is something possibly in the ultrasound category. Well, and you have to look at who benefits on something like this, Linda. There's, there's got to be a reason this is happening. And, and who would benefit from something like this? When Dr. Johnson said, we've never heard of anything like this before, that seems to be the bottom line, and therefore, who do you look to and where do you look if it is some kind of a new weapon system? Weapons, who would wars. have thought, we'll just try it on the Cuban embassy and see what happens to the Americans and the Canadians? Can we be conspiratorial and think somebody's trying to blame the Russians or the Cubans and they're doing this to us to, well, to it, try to create a, a wedge? It is a possibility and of course, always way it's far out there control. on the edge is whether or not something in the alien uh, presence category would be doing something for reasons that are unknown. But uh, here the, the power physical to evidence control. was so uh, great that the University of Pennsylvania, one of the leading centers uh, in the world, would take this on and that they don't have answers, but that, that sentence, they have... The, the, it is like the effects on the humans that they've studied is like concussion to the brain. But there's no evidence of trauma, and that's truly a mystery. A concussion was a back with us who continues with this very strange story about diplomats being really screwed up with in Cuba. Linda? And it is important because we need to understand what has happened if it is a fluke, like in uh, something wrong, an electrical wiring or a machine, no. uh, which some people have suggested. We need to know that. But if not, then... If you try to match up the symptoms of the 34 Cuban embassy diplomats with possible sonic weapons using infrasound, ultrasound, or microwaves, here is a brief breakdown of frequency impacts. We'll start with infrasound. These are frequencies below what you can hear, around 20 hertz downward to 4 hertz. 
In nature, volcanoes and earthquakes emit infrasound that animals can detect, but people can't. At Earth Files, I have a graphic of infrasound weapon targets and effects. And if you go to this uh, part two, you can go through various sound sources related to infrasound, the effects that are known, and targets such as hostage rescue or crowd control or something like that. And as you scroll down on this graphic, you get down to what is called reference number 19. I put a kind of magenta line under it so it would stand out. And here is, in this uh, a comp sort of an accumulation of sound sources, effects, and targets, it says... Directed energy weapons. Non-diffracting, and we're talking about ultrasound, that would be... Uh, or infrasound, sorry, the infrasound, and that this would be an acoustic bullet that creates plasma in front of the target, as if this is something that exists out there. And what does it do? It creates blunt object trauma. Now, is that possibly a clue? Because that's the medical puzzle about what would uh, leave the impact of the first Concussion weapons, bioplasma, aerosol spray. Uh, but they could, they could not find, or concussion. It looked like concussion, and they could not find blunt object uh, trauma evidence. So infrasound might be in the category. Now, ultrasonic frequencies are above 20,000 hertz. And these ultrasonic weapons of various types use sound to injure, incapacitate, or kill an opponent. And some sonic weapons are currently in limited use or in research and development by military and police forces. Recently, computer science engineers at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and China's Zhejiang University investigate the mystery of a regular pattern of peaks in the Cuban embassy sound that is separated by approximately 180 hertz. The professors wanted to know what could make the ripples every 180 hertz and what mechanism could make the ultrasonic source produce audible sound, which it shouldn't be able to do. Well, they have a hypothesis wow. that this might be what's called intermodulation distortion and that this could be, quote, ultrasonic emitters that can produce audible byproducts that could have unintentionally or intentionally harmed the diplomats and the unintentional. Could there have been some weird electronic uh, fluke going on in the Cuban embassy that could have caused this, or is it intentional? The third category, microwaves, the frequencies range from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. Microwave weapons can penetrate walls and rooms, which was described in the embassy. Historically, there have been leaks about Pentagon developments of sonic weapons such as the March 9, 2007 Wired Dot Report entitled Zapping Through the Walls. It highlighted Pentagon research and development of a, quote, ultrasonic, infrasonic cannon weapon that could remotely incapacitate or disarm occupants, compartments of a ship, or rooms of a building, close quote. In the Cuban embassy mystery, Dr. Smith has de determined that audible sound is not causing the range of disabilities reported by the American and Canadian diplomats. So I asked Dr. Smith about directed energies that he continues now from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. The New York Times said, quote, Dr. Smith and his colleagues do not think audible sounds as the injuries. They speculated perhaps a device that produced another sort of harmful energy also produced an audible sound, and these would be in three categories. Low frequency infrasound, high frequency ultrasound, and microwaves. Correct. Now I about transceivers. Nanobot remote controlled transceivers via 
aerosol plasma. can induce brain damage. But at the same time, this is problematic. These are studies where these directed energy impulses are very close to the brain. Sometimes light directly contact with the brain in the case of ultrasound. So not being an expert in these kind of directed it's energy, all transmitted by I can't plasma. speak with authority, but I do recognize that there are a lot of problems with any of those, although those are the leading kits. Could you go into Electrified what you all have now studied in terms of the victims and can you go into your understanding of what can generate in military research or other research low frequency infrasound, which I understand cannot be heard by the normal human ear, high frequency ultrasound and microwaves, you must have been briefed on what kind of research or technology could generate those three types? Well, I think that, you know, people are aware of different types of uh, directed energy weapons of sorts. You know, you've heard of pirates trying to take over a ship, you know, maybe a cruise ship, and certain types of energy beams, sound beams are sent out to try to repel them. There are ways, thinking about shooting down aircraft or missiles, whatever, with different directed energy. So this is public knowledge. There are devices to do this. None that we have known of so far are directed to injuring the human brain. The brain, in addition to yeah, it being sort of holographic, about. it also has sections where the occipital lobe does one thing and so forth. Would there be anything about the specific areas of the brain that would help you understand how the energy had to be focused to cause a complex of symptoms that included terrible headache and disorientation and imbalance and vision out of focus and hearing loss, that all of that, there would have to be more than one part of the brain that would have had to have been targeted? The brain is not like you see the diagrams of the cuts of beef. It doesn't work like that. The regions of the cortex, which is a thin layer on the outside of the brain, that has domain. So the one area, as you said, might control vision. Another area controls arm movement, etc. But they're all part of a network. They send these nerve fibers to other parts of the brain that signals process and then sends it to yet another. So we're really talking about networks. So there's not exact targeting of some specific area so much. It's how some kind of injury affects specific networks that pass throughout the brain. And how are you going to study this going forward? Well, that's neuroimaging, which takes a look at the white matter tracks. The white matter is where these nerve fibers go. Outside the cortex is the gray matter, where the neurons are, the nerve bodies. And then they send a very long, thin nerve fiber called an axon across the white matter. So the white matter is the area that is selectively vulnerable where these nerve fibers all reside going in multiple directions in these tracks, T-R-A-T-S, that form the network of the brain, the electric grid of the brain. And if there were any more new cases, even if most of the Americans and Canadians are gone, is there anybody in Cuba who to have help and that they would get a hold of you if there were new cases? And then would it make sense for people from the United States, say you and the Department of Defense, to go there when there were new cases to see if you could pick up? So you're bringing up a really important point, is that we're trying to develop what we call an operational diagnostic criteria, which basically just means we need a clear diagnosis for this syndrome that some people call Havana syndrome. And we want to be able to have clear identifiers so that it won't just be somebody worried about they might have a stomach flu or have some kind of viral illness or, or other kind of symptoms, something that's not part of the syndrome. So we need to rule in and out individuals with various types of medical complaints. What's being done now is that the State Department has initiated a pretest, a cognitive test. It's a little bit more elaborate, but similar to the types of baseline tests that people take before they participate in sports, for example, so you can more easily determine if they've had a concussion.